Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Yeah, Jana actually invited us nearly two years ago, and it's taken quite some time to be able to find the, the convenient time for all of us. And I think you'll see that both the work that Martin will be presenting later, but also the work I'm presenting, is very much uh, formulated around an idea about thinking about the future and how do we move towards the future. Now, I'm going to give uh, a mixture of two presentations and I'm just going to start that with a, a, a bit of background on a project that I'm running in, in Africa. Now, I'm using a slight modification of the title here. I give this title, Unraveling the Complexity African Farming Systems. But essentially, what we've been doing through our work is trying to understand how we can think about the future for smallholder African farmers, how we can think about targeting technologies. So moving away from the idea of technologies dependent on the conditions in one field to thinking about farms and farming systems and moving away from this idea of silver bullet technologies that work everywhere to what we call best fits. What I'll do later is I'll come back to this project that I'm running on nitrogen fixation technologies that I just introduced as an example of this. So if we think about the background in Africa, this is the problem we face. This is a very typical slide from Zimbabwe on granite soils where we see this problem of soil fertility. It's something I know Sigrun Darling will have seen on her visits there. So we're talking often about in Africa about maize-dominated farming systems, really maize on 80 to 90 percent of the land area. We've got declining soil fertility due to continuous farming without inputs, and we've got a real need for diversification. So my career has been devoted really to looking at these wonderful technologies around nitrogen fixing legumes. So we've got examples here, the legume green manures up at the left, the grain legumes in the center, agroforestry legumes, tree fallows. We've got legume forages, uh, stylosanthes in Madagascar. So we've got these wonderful legumes which can grow beautifully. They can fix nitrogen. They can help us to solve this problem of soil fertility. But when we take them onto smallholder farms, we find a situation often like this, a terrible embarrassment. I'm here with the Director General of CIMIT, this international research organization. We've got all of the researchers there doing participatory work with farmers. And we're all scratching our heads feeling terribly embarrassed because nothing's working. And of course, the farmers say, oh, yeah, but we want you to come and show us your technologies. And we're thinking, yeah, but it's not working. Why is it not working? There are no silver bullets. When we take these technologies that we develop under good conditions out, to these hostile conditions of the farmer, then we find that they fail. And we realize that within these farming systems, if we go to these fields here, they can be so depleted that very little will grow. But look across the farm, look towards the household, to where the house is, and you see that the farmer's growing a perfectly good crop of maize. Farmers know how to grow crops, generally. But we're dealing with this situation where close to the house, there's plenty of manure being applied but the farm is running out of manure, and therefore the soil fertility is very poor. Now, I know some of you have heard Bernard van Lau speaking, I guess, and you'll see a lot of things I'm talking about will actually reflect things that Bernard might have been saying. 
because essentially he and I have been working together on this issue now for over, well, for around 10 years. And then we move to other countries. This is now in Kenya, a slide from Pablo Titanel, where we see going down the slope on this resource poor farm, you see good maize up at the top of the slope nearer to the household. In the middle of the slope, the maize is getting poorer. Down here, there are still maize plants, but you can hardly see them because the growth is so poor. But we just cross the hedge to a richer farmer who's got more resources, has more manure, has the ability to buy fertilizers, and you see a good crop of maize all the way down the slope to the bottom, which is really showing there's a huge diversity between farmers over very, very short distances. And that human management, obviously, is reflected very much in the state of the soil and the state of the potential to grow crops. Now, it was observations like this that led us then to start out in 2001, in fact, on this uh, program we call Nuances. It's looking then, it's uh, looking at the subtleties, if you like, and differences within farming systems, particularly trying to look at trade-offs in African farming systems. So a framework for analysis of trade-offs. And where do we start? This actually came, this whole idea came from discussions I actually had with Ben Van Lau in, in Nigeria in around 2000, when we realized that there were these repeating patterns across African farming systems. So we often start then by doing resource flow mapping. So together with farmers, we make sketches of their farms to understand their farms and their farming systems. And here we have a map on the left, farmer Martha. It's a female single-headed household. She has 0.9 hectares, the only labor available to her is her own labor. She has one chicken in terms of livestock. She earns a little manure for her garden by working for farmer Thomas, who has 3.3 uh, hectares, three full-time labor equivalents to work on his farm. He has um, 11 cattle, two goats, six chickens, much more resources, and he can use manure and fertilizers. And when we capture that then into a simple cartoon, We've got the homestead, we've got the home garden, we've got the infields, the fertile infields, we've got infertile outfields, we've got cattle grazing through the system producing manure, and we have the rangeland, the common land, which is then grazed outside the farming system. We also have farmer Martha, only poor fields, a little home garden, a smaller farm. Within those Farming, the farming system, the dynamics of nutrient flow, the dynamics within the system are very much driven by the livestock. So the livestock grazing through the farming system, producing manure, the manure being targeted back to these home fields and to the home garden. We've got fertilizers also being used where they're used on those better fields, the fields that guarantee the farmer's food security. We've got some export in terms of products and labor. We've got some import in terms of fertilizers or manure to the farms. And it's against that backdrop that we have to start to think about the different technologies we have. So here's our basket of technology options for addressing soil fertility. And you'll see it's basically it's manure and fertilizers or different legume technologies that I showed you in the slide before. So we're dealing with grain legumes, forage legumes, tree legumes, and green manures. We've got to think then about where do these technologies fit within that complexity of farming systems. And in order to do this and to think then about the future, we've been spent 10 years, in fact, developing this modular approach of modeling. And this is all documented and published, so I can, I can pass on papers to those who are interested within this nuances framework. So we've got FarmSim, which has then, we have uh, crop soil models here for different fields. The fields are stacks of cards. We've got a livestock model. We've got the heap, the manure heap here. The household actually controlling everything that's going on in terms of their objectives and decisions. And we can then look at scenarios around differences in changing climate or differences in changing market. The interaction with common property resources on the common land and then uh, flows to and from the cities in terms of remittances and payments, which are very, very important in most of these farming systems. Now, we were fortunate to get some funding from the EU, which actually allowed us to set up work across uh, initially eight countries. We expanded that to 10. 
then working across a gradient of rainfall from uh, 400 millimeters cereal dominated livestock systems to, to forest systems at the other extreme. Within each location, we did these typologies of, of different farm households so we could look at the differences between rich and poor households. And we can then make comparisons within each location and also comparisons between them. So to get an idea, a picture across Africa. Now some of the key findings then, as we went on, that these gradients that we see moving away from the household aren't just soil fertility gradients. They're actually what we call resource management gradients because, of course, the farmers are planting their crops earliest, close to the household. They actually plant the maize more densely. As well as being fertilized on time, it's weeded on time because they know this is their guaranteed good crop in terms of their food security. The crop further away tends to get planted much later. It's planted much sparser. It receives no nutrients, and it's weeded very late. You can see this field has just been clean weeded, although that crop's not going to yield anything at all. So it's not simply, as we see there, a product of the different soil fertility inputs that gives us this picture. This is actually a picture, as any agronomist knows, getting a good crop is all about timing. It's about doing things on time, and if you're delayed in your activities, then that multiplies the effects of poor soil fertility. Now, within many of our systems, we're dealing here in Zimbabwe. This is about the best quality grazing at the end of the dry season. So we've got livestock which are actually losing weight through the dry season, producing very, very poor quality manure, which is often stored under very poor conditions like this in the open, and therefore the resource you have in terms of the organic matter going back to the field is very poor. But this is used strategically by farmers. And one of the first exercises we did using um, simple models calibrated using chronosequence data that we collected was to look here at, this is using a model study, so the soil carbon actually changing rapidly over time on these sandy soils. Maize yields actually going down together with that change in soil carbon if no manure is applied. If we have enough manure, so this is eight tons of manure on the farm to cover all of the fields, we can actually hold up and maintain the soil carbon at a much higher level and we can actually maintain maize yields. If we've got a limited amount of manure and that's applied sequentially from the infields to the middle fields to none to the outfields, then, of course, we create a soil fertility gradient. There's nothing remarkable about this, but I think what's remarkable is how fast it happens because here you see soil carbon actually crashing within five years on these sandy soils so that we're in a position that maize yields are, uh, are crashing within that period and that we can actually have these human-induced changes actually over very, very short time periods. And we've been able to ground that by doing some field research. These are experiments which we actually set up in 2001. We're running them the last year, this year, through uh, Leonard Ruzinamodzi, who's a student who's also working with Sigrun Dahlin here. And what we've done here is we've done some terrible things to this infield because we've kept some plots properly manured, but we've also stopped applying manure to some fields. And this was after just three seasons. You can see yields collapsing in these sandy soils where no inputs have been added, even though that soil had been maintained very fertile before. If we look on the outfield here, this is actually the situation after three years, where in this foreground, where 100 kilograms of nitrogen and 30 kilograms of phosphorus have been applied for three years. And if we think about the use efficiency of fertilizer, well, we get good use efficiency on the infields. We've got pathetic use efficiency on these fields, obviously, and behind Seamus Ngori and the farmer here, the maize is recovering, getting towards that use efficiency we had earlier, but this is only after three years of addition of very large quantities of manure which aren't available on the farm. So what's going on in these fields? Well, when we look in detail, we actually find that these soils, and you know, it's hard to call them soils at times, I mean, they're very coarse granite sands with virtually nothing else in them. 
have actually got multiple nutrient deficiencies. This is showing up classic symptoms of zinc deficiency because zinc was critically deficient. You add phosphorus, it locks up the last zinc, you get very poor plant growth. So you're in a situation then where you're dealing with soils which are actually very hard to recover. And going back to the Kenya example I was showing you of these gradients that we see in Kenya, well actually we find the same. Here now with a legume crop, the legume growing close to the house on those good soils which have been manured over time, we get a beautiful crop of our nitrogen fixing soybean. In fact, if we go in this picture just to the far end of the field, so we're walking a distance of around 50 meters, then our legumes are growing like this. They can't establish multiple nutrient deficiencies in a soil that you can see has lost all of its structure because there's no organic matter being added. And we see that then in terms of both maize here on the responsive fields, unresponsive fields, soybean, responsive fields, unresponsive fields. This is uh, Bernard Van Lau in around 2004, and I think you've noticed that he, he's lost considerable weight since then. Anyway, Now, in terms of this complexity, well, what, what do we do about it? We know that farmers aren't all the same. We've got these richer farmers who've actually got good fields across their farm because they're able to use plenty of resources. We've got farmers who are constrained in resources. They put them on close to the house and then they develop these gradients with poor fields further away. We've got poor farmers who just have poor fields. So how do we capture all of that complexity if we're trying to think about targeting of technologies? Well, for one thing, we can reduce that already down to just three field types. Because you can see, although we've got here many different fields, we've only got, basically in this diagram, three field types. We've got the good fields, which don't respond particularly to fertilizer because they're quite fertile already. We've got responsive fields, and when we've got these poor unresponsive fields. And we argue, basically, that when we develop our decision rules for nutrient applications here, we, we normally develop these in terms of response experiments on stations and the like. We pass them through some decision rules in relation to market prices. But what we have to do now is to pass them through an extra filter to actually think then about poorly responsive fertile fields, which simply need maintenance fertilization. We've got the intermediate fields, the responsive fields, and then we've got these outfields which are poorly responsive, where we shouldn't be using any of these technologies or inputs before we've rehabilitated them, because we know things aren't going to work. Big question is, of course, how do we rehabilitate them? And in some of the farming systems that we're working, these poorly responsive fields can actually be as much as 60% of the land area. So it's not an insignificant problem. So what do we do? Well, we look at our legume technologies. This is John O'Gem in a PhD comparing green manures, soybean, uh, macuna behind a whole range of different legumes, where he was working with a farmer who basically said, well, this crop that she's got here, this cannavalia, this green manure, it's, it's wonderful. It's so luxuriant. I think you're cheating on us, she said to us. I think somebody's coming in and fertilizing this at night because if I grow my maize here, it looks so yellow. But of course, that's the power of nitrogen fixation. So you explain, yeah, but it's fixing nitrogen from the air and it can improve your soil. But she says, yeah, but what can I use it for? I've, I've got hungry mouths to feed. I can't afford to spend a whole season growing a green manure when we're not going to be producing any food. I need to be growing food now. And so we tend to think to expand this idea of niches within farming systems. So this is the classical ecological theory of the n-dimensional hyperspace that describes the niche for a species. In agroecological terms, we tend to think of that in relation to climate, soil fertility, role in the cropping system, but we're saying basically we have to expand that to think about labor, economic yields, the substitution. If you grow one thing, you can't grow something else. The investment required. And we have to think much broader in relation to the agronomic and socioeconomic dimensions. So we coin what we call the socio-ecological niche for technologies, when we're targeting technologies. Now, an example of that, then, work of Pablo Titanel in Western Kenya. We've got a typology here of different farms. So we've got wealthy small farms. These are people who've often retired from the city. They have a few 
uh, pension coming in and they have some dairy cows, but they're actually feeding the dairy cows by buying napier grass from other farmers. We've got other wealthier farmers with, here with nearly three hectares with quite a lot of land, some cash crops. We've got poorer farmers here, getting the farms getting smaller, local breeds of cattle growing maize and beans and some napier grass, which they're, a lot of which they're selling to the wealthier farmers. And what happens in these systems in relation to their management, current management? So we're looking here then at energy over time. So this is over 20 seasons using our integrated farm model. And the dotted line is the food needs of the family. And the solid line is the food production in terms of calorific value of all crops. And you can see then, this is a, a food self-sufficiency analysis, if you like, that these farms are not food self-sufficient at all. But for the wealthier farmers there, it's not a problem. They're producing milk. They can sell to the market. They can buy their food. These farmers, the, the larger farms, which have cash crops, they're also food sufficient in nearly all the years, except when there's a particular drought. But of course, they can tide over that drought because they've got enough resources. Farm type three, where well, they start off doing okay, but you can see because they're mining their resources to sell the napier grass to their neighbors, actually they're depleting and mining the farm. So over time, their yields are collapsing and they're heading really into a food insecure situation. And this is farm type four, where you see a parlor situation where in terms of food self-sufficiency all the way through. And these are basically the people who are earning their money as laborers within the local community to earn their food. There's actually a farm type five who are even poorer, but they didn't have livestock and we didn't include them in this analysis. So this is the type of analysis we can do within these integrated models. And I want to move on now to give you one example of, of how we're doing that. Also doing these participatory experiments with farmers where we put together all of these different technologies. So this is an agroforestry legume. We've got macuna, we've got soya beans, we've got manure. And when you put all of these technologies together and you ask a farmer, well, what do you want? Well, actually, what we find is that the first choice is always a grain legume. It's a legume that can give you food now, no matter what's happening for the longer term. The second choice are what we call the multi-purpose grain legumes. They're often grain legumes with slightly less, less yield, but much more biomass and much more of a boost for soil fertility. The third choice, well, fodder legumes or fodder trees, but things with direct use within the farm. The fourth choice would be woody legumes, often for steaks or other purposes, poles. And the very, very last choice are these things that many of us have invested a huge number of years perfecting and researching, which are the green manures, the organic methods of producing soil fertility, the cover crops, the fertilizer trees, because simply they don't give that immediate benefit that farmers are looking for. And then we have to ask, well, what has all been all this fuss about, you know, the World Food Prize that Pedro Sanchez won for promotion of these fertilizer trees? And we find out it's actually been a pseudo-adoption the enthusiasm of the researchers and the NGOs buying the seed at inflated prices have basically provoked a market response in farmers to sell the seed back to the NGOs. As soon as the project stops, it collapses and they disappear completely. And we just did a survey of 300 farms in Kenya and found actually we could find these uh, improved fallow trees that Pedro Sanchez won the World Food Prize for having extended to hundreds of thousands of farmers. Out of 300 farms, we could find them on three farms in the last years, last two years. And basically, that was farmers keeping the trees in the hope that somebody was going to come and buy the seed. So we've got to be very careful then in thinking about this complexity in farming systems and these different types of technologies. Now, I was basically asked two years ago, three years ago now, what could we do with nitrogen fixation which would actually make a difference in Africa now. And we came up with this project then, which we call putting nitrogen fixation to work for smallholder farmers in Africa. We've developed that project around this idea. So it's a genotype by environment by management interaction. But of course, we have two genotypes here, the genotype of the legume and the genotype of the rhizobium. I think this will be familiar 
as a simple way of looking at crop yields to most of you with a, a, a training in cropping or agronomy. So we need to, here to look at the interaction between the legume and the rhizobium, their tailoring to the environment, and then the role of management in actually getting a good crop. And of course, management here is good agronomy, inoculation, seeding rates, plant density, etc. Now, inoculation might be strange to some of you, but of course, it's a very old technology. It's been around for more than 100 years. Here are a couple of commercial packets of inoculum. And that inoculum is simply then mixed into seed in little buckets like this in the field, added to the seed, shaken around, so you here have inoculated seed that can be introduced into the field. And that then gives us this benefit you can see here. These are uninoculated rows of soybean against inoculated soybeans with lots of lovely nodules, so we get that benefit of nitrogen fixation. And we've been working then with funding now from the Gates Foundation, we're working three regions of Africa, West Africa, East and Central and Southern Africa, with four grain legumes, cowpea, groundnut and soybean, uh, and common bean, but different legumes in the different regions, and legume forages we have throughout. So we're working across these eight countries. Um, I'll skip on to show that basically what we're trying to do is to set up our analysis in relation to distance to markets. So this is uh, a map of market access from, uh, so, uh, from uh, Rwanda and Congo. Linking that to agroecology, so here the length of the growing period, so that we can actually set up a matrix of sites with um, low population, high market access, low in, uh, potential in terms of growing period, etc. So we've got a nice matrix. And essentially what we're trying to do is to set this up as a, as a learning project of where do technologies work and why do they work under certain conditions. Now some early results from the first year, this is then some of these beautiful soybeans here with a, a ladies farmer group in West Africa. And we're doing very simple experimentation. So experiments like this where we have a control plus phosphorus plus inoculum plus P plus inoculum. You could say almost trivial experiments in many ways. But we put these out across many, many farms. So in cases we're developing data sets with, say, 300 different individual farms. This is a slide showing some of these results in Congo. Here we've got the yield in the control treatment plotted against the yield in the treatment with phosphorus and inoculum or both. And what you can see, first of all, is that the yields vary enormously from close to zero, which would really be some of our unresponsive soils I was talking about before, up to around two and a half tons of grain. Adding phosphorus on its own is giving a response in some cases, these points above the line, but in many cases not. Inoculation, the uh, orangey red points, the squares here, well, that's giving quite some benefit. But look at the benefit here with phosphorus and inoculation together. And it's really quite stunning. In these cases here, taking yields from around one ton of grain per hectare up to three tons of grain per hectare. But what's going on down here? We've got soils which are poor, where the yields are poor in the control, where we're getting no response. And there we're finding other problems like this, problems of other nutrients. This is potassium deficiency. In another site, the results are really not so beautiful. Here we've got yielding control against yielding treatment, same as before, and the plots are everywhere. But if you look here, all of these yields are below one ton per hectare. And it, essentially, if we put that along the graph that I showed you just before, all of the points are down in this little corner here. But is that then due to the problem with the soils all being so poor there? Well, actually, we find in this case, we had a post-emergence drought, which actually wiped out the plant population. So you get very, very poor plant establishment in that area, even though it's actually only 30 kilometers from the first area. And that led then to this real problem of very, very poor yields in every case, a problem of drought that is very, very difficult to overcome. But in the very good cases, of course, we're getting situations Situations like this, sorry, where 
really stunning responses in terms of agronomy, in terms of yields. Now we're working then in a number of different environments, including this one in central Rwanda. I'm walking between two fields of climbing beans in northern Rwanda. Beans were introduced into Africa in the 16th century from Latin America, from South America, along with maize, and they've traveled together through Africa ever since. What you see here now, though, these climbing beans, were actually only found in a very few pockets in northern Rwanda and in DRC, but in the very highlands. Here we are around 2,000, 2,300 meters above sea level. We're very high up. That means that it's a cooler climate and these beans actually take much longer to grow and develop than the bush beans. If we go back to the 1970s, what you'd have found here is 90% or more of the landscape would be covered with the bush beans, the, the short beans, and just a very, very few fields of climbing beans. The difference is here we have mixed the same fertilizer as in the other plot with organic matter. Organic matter usually is manure, you know, collected from the stables where the cows are, mixed with some household material, and put in the pocket at planting. You also see that the biomass is higher, more bushy, with a lot more pots everywhere. Which means that the whole process of biological nitrogen fixation doesn't have any limitations anymore and can fix as it, at its optimal rates. So in conclusion, if we really want to make biological nitrogen fixation work, we need to also take care of all the other soil constraints that may retard or uh, delay biological nitrogen fixation. So, an Uppsala professor for you speaking in the video. So, looking then at this combination in each case then of genotype by environment by management. And an example here of climbing beans. So, across four different sites, different varieties. And essentially, you'll see in some cases, like here, this variety doing very poorly. In other cases, it doing among the best. So, a very strong genotype by environment interaction. And we find that this simple equation is actually very useful uh, in explaining particularly to our donor that, that actually management is really key beyond just the idea of, of uh, breeding and genetics. This is an example then of what happens after climbing beans, maize following maize, maize following climbing beans, because the residual nitrogen benefits can be huge as well. But I want to show you one little bit of video here then, which actually shows, if you like, the extreme case of questioning, in a sense, what can we do for farmers when they're very, very poor.
feed in terms of seven children there. And the only livestock she has are actually the guinea pigs and the rabbits. And in the experiments that they've been doing with... Oops, sorry, flight through. That this is basically the situation on these extremely infertile soils in this part of Congo. Essentially, out manure yields are extremely poor, 200 to 400 kilos of grain per hectare. And this is actually the climbing beans grown with a little teaspoonful of manure that's collected. And it might seem trivial, but even on these very small plots, if you think about the food security for a family like that, if you can double production, which you are doing on these tiny plots of 0.2 to 0.4 hectares, it's still actually having a very major impact in terms of food security for those poor farmers. So to finish off, my colleagues are often saying to me, well, what are you doing with this project? It's really a development project. It's not really research. But I mean, I say actually, I call it a, a development to research project rather than the research for development project. Because essentially what we're doing is we're doing delivery and dissemination. So dissemination and development here. We have monitoring and evaluation all around that, across all of these different environments, across all these different types of farms. And that actually monitoring and evaluation actually forms the research, which then feeds back and provides the learning to feed back into the development and uh, dissemination activities. So that over time, we're learning about which technologies fit well. And actually, we are I'd, I'd argue that we're developing from this extremely important messages for policy in terms of which types of interventions are actually likely to make a difference for farmers of, of different wealth across these different countries. So in conclusion then, from this nitrogen fixation example, we can show then that the genotypes are key, but actually environment and management are overriding. This is an extremely important message for foundations like the Gates Foundation are pouring billions of dollars into Africa, the majority of it into biotechnology and breeding, when actually 80 to 90% of the yield gap is actually due to agronomy and soil fertility issues. I think that's an extremely important message. The success stories we have with our legumes depend on good technologies, so good agronomy, but of course, linking that very much into markets. I'd argue that we need these ex-ante methods using our models like nuances then to advise policy and development agencies. I think that legume nitrogen fixation has a great role to play in African agriculture, but not on its own. And I would agree here with other critics, if you like, of the organic agriculture movement and the push for organic agriculture in Africa, because simply organic approaches on their own are not enough. We need more nutrients into the system, and fertilizers are absolutely necessary. And if you want to read more, we've got a lot of videos on this website, so lots of video materials. We've got a monthly newsletter, and there's a review paper we just published in Ag Systems, which actually summarizes much of this work we've been doing uh, on our nuances approach to understand the complexity of African smallholder systems. Uh, and that's there uh, in that article. So thanks very much.